Why, Richter? Why did you refuse such an honor? How could you have refused it? An honor bestowed upon you by the hand of Chapter Master Marnaeus Kalgar himself, no less. I do not understand. You deserved it, brother. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Throne. Your whole damn task force deserved it. I lower the wine goblet from my lips and carefully set it aside. I should have known Antorolon would ask me this question. Should have suspected the topic of my unprecedented actions would be breached the moment he sought a private audience with me aboard the Daughter of Tempests. I regard him now with some caution. This Astartes I had come to consider a friend and a trustworthy ally. The Marine's errant captain stands before me, adorned in ceremonial battleplate. Each segment of blue and white ceramite polished to a lustrous parade ground sheen. His crested helmet tucked under one arm, his goblet of wine barely touched in his right hand. He does not appear to be angered or offended. He seems merely perplexed and disappointed. Despite his rank and the accolades he has accumulated during the course of the Corinth Crusade, he cannot compel me to justify my decisions. We meet as equals, as the appointed leaders of our respective chapter forces, and as brother cousins who have jointly shed greenskin blood during several successful campaigns. Still, if there is any Astartes outside of my command cadre who deserves an explanation for my actions, it is him and him alone. It is because we are undeserving of such an honor, Antorolon, I answer grimly, as I stride over to the hololithic projection table dominating the center of the candlelit, shadow-haunted chamber. Unlike the Marine Errant, I am unarmored, with my sole suit of warplate still being repaired by the few tech marines and artificer serfs left to us. I pace restlessly about the archaic device, clad in my synth wall duty robes, my hair falling unbound over my tensed shoulders, one bare foot treading quietly upon the threadbare carpet, while its recently grafted augmented twin clunks dully against the hard deck plate beneath. The flesh wounds I received during the orc's repeated boarding actions may have mended, but it is the spiritual lacerations festering in my hearts that are taking far longer to heal. Undeserving! Antorolon scoffs in a rare display of open amusement. Undeserving of an iron halo. Undeserving of the great glory and honor bestowed upon both you and the Lamenta chapter by fellow Astartes in recognition of your monumental achievement. You said the same thing to the Lord Kalgar at the award ceremony, and had I not been present to witness the exchange, I would have never believed you had spoken such words. Why did you do it, Reichter? What would cause you to? I hold up a forestalling finger as my hand dances over the inlaid cogitator rooms in an all too familiar sequence. Three seconds later, a hololithic projection of the orc mining world of Slaughterhouse 3 explodes into existence in the air above our heads. Accompanied by scrolling text screeds of accumulated data and our compiled after action reports. What do you see, brother? I growl softly unable to keep the pained bitterness from my voice. Look closely, and tell me what you see. The Marine Errant gazes analytically at the revolving image of a planet laid utterly to waste, his grey eyes narrowing as he tries to puzzle out whether or not I am asking him a rhetorical question. It does not matter. I already know what he is going to say. He will never see what I see. He cannot feel as I feel. In this I consider him fortunate. At times I even envy him. I see a great victory, Aeneas. For that is what it is. And Torolon speaks with all the confidence of a zealot, whose purpose and goals will forever be clear and unquestionable. His deliberate use of my forename driving home his unshakable belief in the place of a space marine within the Imperium of Man. I see the total destruction of vital enemy assets, the complete denial of invaluable war materials, and, in time, the very destabilization of the Orcs' resistance to our holy endeavors to see them eradicated from the Corinthian system and beyond. The Marine Errant smiles, 
a noble warrior's smile full of pride and satisfaction. I cannot recall the last time such an expression crossed my own face. But that is not all, brother. Setting down his goblet, Antorolon steps up to me, still smiling. He rests a gauntlet upon my shoulder and it takes all my self-control to keep from pulling away. I do not like being touched, especially by those who are not my chapter brethren. I see also that these are the results of actions undertaken by Valorous Space Marines, the heroic battle brothers of your own task force, Reichter. You fought against a vastly superior force of Greenskins and destroyed Slaughterhouse 3 on your own, without my aid, or the aid of the Ultramarines, the Silver Skulls or any other Astartes contingent that crusades with us. This glorious achievement belongs solely to the Lamenters, now and for all time. It was a good deed. No, it was a great one. One most worthy of the Lord Kalgar's praise and honor. You fulfilled your mission alone, and still emerged victorious, even in the face of overwhelming odds and despite the loss of so many Marines. Those are the kinds of deeds upon which legacies and legends are built, brother. Those are the grand feats of initiative and audacity every warrior of the Emperor should aspire to. No! I cry, the word clawing free of my mouth like a curse. I push Antorolon's hand away and step back several paces, gesturing despairingly up at the hololithic planet flickering above us. Anger and grief overcome me and the veneer of my self-control cracks like porcelain. You do not see. You look, Estir, but you do not see. You behold a decisive victory. I behold only a colossal tomb, a vast graveyard that will forever stand as a lasting monument to the consequences of my great failure. The Marine Errant's eyes widen, and he favors me with a look of utter incredulity. He does not understand, yet how can I expect him to? Misfortune and disaster do not overshadow his every decision and action. Melancholy does not saturate his soul. Nor do bloody visions of his slaughtered Primarch trouble his rest. And Torolon is a worthy scion of a venerable chapter, forged of pure gene stock, who looks upon the galaxy as a true Astartes is meant to. And I... I am a descendant of botched laboratory experiments. An accursed creature whose raw bleeding hearts are forever bared before the ravening jaws and thirsting blades of a cruel and pitiless universe. How can you say that, Reichter? The Space Marine demands, his demeanor stiffening, his patrician features hardening. What failure are you speaking of? I see nothing. When I gave the order for the seismic charges my battle brothers had planted in the depths of Slaughterhouse Three's mines to be detonated, I signed the death warrants of nearly three million mortal men, women, and children. I roar in anguish, unable to maintain my composure any longer. Were those enemy assets blaspheming heretics and Torolon? Were they malcontent rebels seeking to cast off Imperial rule? Did they kneel in secret before obscene altars and lift up their hands to supplicate false gods? No! They were slaves. All of them. Prisoners captured during raids on dozens of worlds along the eastern fringe and funneled by their hundreds of thousands into the planet's mines to work until they perished. When I petitioned Crusade Command to be granted leave to attack Slaughterhouse, I did so in order to effect liberation, not merely to deny the Orcs a resource-rich world. I pause in my tirade and take a deep forceful breath, running a trembling hand across my saliva-wet mouth, blinking in alarm as pulsing tendrils of the brightest crimson begin to writhe across my vision. Heedless of my dignity, I fall to my knees, clawing at the carpet as I struggle to regain control of my emotions. 
Both my hearts are hammering, fit to burst, and my strained muscles are slick with sweat. I grit my teeth in agony, wishing desperately I was in the crucible of battle once again, drowning my unceasing sorrows in oceans of Xenos blood. Red-tinged tears course freely down my cheeks. Unsettled, the Marine Errant backs away, his free hand dropping instinctively to his holstered bolt pistol, concern and revulsion warring across his face in equal measure. But you did liberate the Manaeus. They all died as they wished to die, as free men and women, thanks to the sacrifices of your task force. Despite his own alarm, Antorolon still attempts to console me now that the full extent of my inner turmoil has been revealed. You could not have foreseen you would end up freeing such a vast number of slaves. It was no fault of your own that you did not have enough ships to evacuate them all, or that the Orc reinforcement fleet would not give you the needed time to do so. No one blames you for failing to save them all, Reichter. No one except yourself. The Lord Kalgar wanted to award you with an iron halo in recognition of what you did manage to accomplish. Contrary to the rumors, he did not offer it as a consolation prize, nor to assuage his own guilt for refusing to provide assistance. Rumors? What? Rumors? I snarl as I rise, absently wiping drying tears from my face as a measure of restraint returns and shame takes hold of me for having behaved in such a manner in the presence of an outsider. I seize Antorolon's goblet and quickly drain the remainder of its contents. The spiced honey wine cannot intoxicate me, but the taste is pleasant, and the simple act seems to reassure my wary ally. Now it is the Marine Errant's turn to be gripped by anger and frustration. An iron halo is an honor that cannot be so bluntly turned down, Reichter. Yet you have done so. Rumors are making inroads. Dark rumors. Because you declined to give a concise reason for refusing the medal, many Astartes amongst the other chapter forces, and more than a few Ultramarines, feel aggrieved and slighted on Kalgar's behalf. Some are saying you did it deliberately, to insult the Lord of Macrag for refusing to lend further assistance to your mission, despite him agreeing to it. Others are claiming your actions were motivated by arrogant pride, that such an honor bestowed by the hand of the greatest of living chapter masters was not good enough for the daring Lamenter captain, who had achieved one of the most strategic victories of the entire crusade by the skin of his teeth. A few bastards have even held forth that Kalgar offered you the halo out of guilt for not providing you with additional support, thereby unknowingly depriving the Ultramarines of their chance to partake in the glory. And Torilon sighs and shakes his head. All I want is to know the truth of the matter, Aeneas. I see now that the halo means nothing to you. Yet I know you are a man whose hearts are devoid of arrogance and I've nearly come to blows with several naysayers in the defense of your honor. Will you not entrust me with the truth, brother? Will you not just tell me why? I make my way to a chair and collapse into it, feeling as worn and weary as my battered battle barge. And Torilon relaxes somewhat and removes his hand from his sidearm. Rumors. Of course there would be rumors. Of course they would reach the ears of the Marines errant. Of course my ally would seek to defend me against slander and unjust accusations, even though the Ultramarines are his chapter's progenitors. The captain is a worthy friend, one I do not deserve. I will tell him the truth. I will confess it to him, though doing so will cause us both nothing but pain. Blood of Sanguinius. Why did he have to ask? Why couldn't I have been left alone to mourn and nurse my wounds in peace? Rumors or no rumors. The truth of the matter is that I am ashamed, Antorolon. I raise my head and meet his gaze, my bloodshot eyes boring into his. Unable to stand the sight of an Astarte so tormented by such human emotions, the Marine Errant adverts his face. 
Do you think it was a decision I made lightly? I was tempted to accept the Iron Halo, tempted as any other space marine to bask in the adulation and acclaim of my peers, for even a lamenter still possesses a warrior's dignity and a warrior's pride. But as exalted as Marnea's Kalgar may be, he is not my liege. Come the Crusade's end and my men and I will eventually return to the Mater Lacrimarum, whereupon I shall be expected to kneel before Malakin Foros, my chapter master, and give a personal account of my deeds and the deeds of my battle brothers, both those living and those dead and... and... My voice trails off and the tears threaten to spill again as unwelcome memories of the final desperate engagement flood into my tumultuous mind. The daughter of Tempest shuddering as she unleashed her payloads against wave upon wave of orc ramships, kill cruisers and fighter bombers. A lone battle barge, her escorts and under two hundred lamenters defying nightmarish odds to buy enough time for less than a tenth of the freed prisoners in the few transport vessels and slaver ships capable of warp travel to escape off-world. The bestial war cries of green boarding parties as they piled into our beleaguered barge, only to be beaten back by the unrestrained savagery of unprecedented numbers of Battle Brothers lost to the madness of the Black Rage. The last signal received from the men and women still stranded planet side imploring me to grant them a merciful death so that they might never again be the pawns of vile Xenos. The surface of Slaughterhouse 3 consumed in great tectonic upheavals as hundreds of seismic charges are detonated deep within its mines and tunnels. Scores of yellow armored bodies lying lifeless in corridors choked with the rent remains of butchered orcs. A victory that is also a defeat, and a defeat that is also a victory. All of this and more I must relate to Lord Foros upon my return. If I return. And Aeneas. And Torolon's voice is a low murmur. He is still making a point of not meeting my eyes. I push the intrusive recollections from my mind and all but spit the exact reason for my refusal at the Marine Errant's feet. And what would it have availed me, brother, to enter into the presence of my liege and the elite veterans of our first company as a victor covered in glory, bearing an iron halo? one of the most prestigious honors that can be bestowed upon an Astartes. That had been won at the cost of an entire planet's worth of martyred men, women, and children. How could I have dared to meet the desolate gaze of the Lord of Ruin and present him with a medal consecrated in the blood of nearly three million of the Emperor's loyal subjects? My entire brotherhood would have been disgusted, and I would have been unable to live with the shame of it. That is why I could not accept the halo and Torolon. Why I dared not accept it. This great victory is naught but bitter ashes on my tongue. Let the naysayers claim what they will. I still stand by what I told the Lord of the Ultramarines. We were undeserving of the honor. Kalgar understood, even if his fawning sycophants do not. This is the truth, the very heart of the matter. Are you satisfied, Estia? Does this answer your question? And Torolon is silent for a long moment, standing statue still as he takes in my words. The light from the dozens of candles flickering across his pristine armor and shimmering in his cropped blonde hair. Yet the shifting shadows agitated by the flames seem to swell in the silence before flowing between us like that dark Stygian river of ancient Terran myth that separates the dead from the living. I am cut off, sundered from all familiar surroundings. Motionless I sink, floundering as rearing night black waves threaten to engulf me. The abyss yawns invitingly. I shudder, as if enveloped by a deathly cold. I should have never granted the Marine Errant an audience, should never have attempted to justify or explain myself to him. I am alone. My chapter is alone. We have always been alone and we always will be. The moment lasts for an eternity. The shadows lengthen. 
They curl around my hearts and entwine about my thoughts, constricting, devouring, swallowing. Yes, I am sorry, Aeneas. The moment ends. I am somehow still breathing. And Torolon confronts my gaze and there is nothing but naked pity in this space marine's eyes. I should have left the matter alone. I had no right to test the bonds of our friendship with such invasive questions. Forgive me. I will take my leave and trouble you no more. The Emperor protects. He dons his helmet, obscuring his pity behind an unreadable mask of martial dispassion, then inclines his head and makes the sign of the Aquila. I rise and do likewise. I say nothing. I do not trust myself to speak. Formalities concluded, Captain Estir Antoleron strides from my private chambers to be rejoined by his waiting honor guard. With an anguished animalistic roar, I snatch the empty wine goblet from the chair's armrest and hurl it with all my might at the projection table, destroying the cup and causing the hololith of that vast planetary tomb to wink back out of existence. The silence closes in again, the isolating shadows drawing tighter about me like coiling snakes. Exhaustion sweeps over me and I stagger like a man intoxicated. My senses falter and I feel myself falling at last, falling into the void that consumes everything at the end. Falling. Falling. Then I am caught. A pair of powerful arms wrap around me as my knees start to buckle. The shadows slowly dissipate, and I gradually become aware of my surroundings. I hear the thrum of active fiber bundles and feel the familiar contours of ceramite plating pressing against my skin. Brother Captain. Chaplain Clopas's harsh war-worn voice rasps from his vox grill like a blood-staffed revenant. Be still. I am here. Return to the light. Return to those you cherish. I clutch at the Space Marine's pauldrons like a drowning man anchoring myself against the solid reality of his imposing black armored form. He holds me, and I allow myself to be held. You are weary, Aeneas. There is neither scorn nor condemnation in Clopas's observation, only knowing sympathy for my plight. I nod my head, reassured and comforted by the steady beating of his twin hearts. Yes. I am weary unto death, but I'm still too much of a stubborn bastard to yield. The old chaplain scrutinizes me through the baleful red eye lenses of his alabaster skull helm. Somehow I know he is grinning, despite his own internal pain. I am glad to hear it, Captain. Come, let us head to the chapel together. It is almost time for evening prayers. And your warriors are waiting for you. My warriors. With a grueling effort of will, I soar above of the ocean of melancholy, threatening to swallow me and come fully back to myself. I am not alone. My battle brothers are with me still, even when my strength fails and my grief overwhelms me. Less than a hundred Astartes remain standing after the liberation of Slaughterhouse Three and not a man amongst them objected to my refusal of Kalgar's Iron Halo. Our love for our liege and for the Emperor's people is far greater than our hunger for the transitory honors and praises of those who have lost sight of what it means to be the bulwark against the terror. For we are lamenters. Our blades, our blood, our tears, and our deaths we offer up without complaint to the Imperium of Man even as our Primarch Progenitor freely offered up his. We are the Zions of Sanguinius. Ours is the glory of sacrifice eternal. Ours is the duty that never ends. I stand back from Brother Clopas, and we grip one another's forearms firmly in a proper warrior's embrace. 
The stalwart chaplain's continued survival was a blessing beyond my ability to articulate. I would be truly lost without him. For those we cherish. I recite the first part of our chapter's battle cry with a welcome sense of pride and satisfaction, adding grandeur to the words. We die in glory. Clopas finishes with a guttural cry of pious defiance. Then he draws his ancient crozius and brandishes it over me reprovingly. You have been brooding here in solitude and shadows for far too long, Captain Aeneas Rector. Your men have been deprived of your presence long enough. As penance, you will be required to run all the way to the chapel like a panicked courier serf with a horde of demons on his trail. I will follow at your heels at a dignified jog. Hopefully we will arrive before our brothers all fall asleep on their feet. Otherwise I will have to yell even more than I already do. And you know my voice isn't what it used to be. Now I am also grinning in spite of myself. Run? Run about my own ship like a frightened mortal? My good chaplain, I regret to inform you that all of Kalgar's praise has completely gone to my head. Running in panic is too base an act for me now. Besides, why simply run when we can race? Race? The two of us? Clopas laughs outright. Ha! You are an arrogant well, Peneus. It is quite hopeless. I will best you quite handily, for I am fully armoured while you might as well be naked. Victory shall be mine, even if I gave you a ten second head start. I, Aeneas! I am already hurtling out of the chamber and dashing down the corridor as fast as my legs can carry me. My robes streaming behind me like grey wings. Last one to the chapel is a mortar factor! Clopas comes charging after me like an enraged bullgrox, bellowing colourful castigations at the top of his lungs. I put on more speed, feeling every fibre of my genhanced body surge anew to vigorous life. My pounding heart's almost giddy with pure delight. It is as if I am regressing back to the long lost days of an unremembered childhood. I throw back my head and laugh with the blended joy of both a boy and a god as I race from the darkness back towards the light and to the cherished warriors awaiting me to lead them in deeds of glory once more. <laughs>